She's the most dangerous woman fighter in the world. Chris Cyborg, yet again! I have to fight outside the cage all the time, not just fight the cage. Okay, you're almost there, baby. Oh, no, baby. Uh, this is kind of a dirty little secret. How do you drop 26 pounds in two days? Uh, this is the worst part, because this is the real fight. <laughs> 139. Welcome to Outside the Lines. I'm Bob Lee. Mixed martial arts, they've exploded from a sport banned in 36 states at the turn of the century to the recent sale of the UFC for $4 billion. Opportunities are there for fighters if they can make weight. For some, at times, that can be life-threatening, especially for women. For Chris Justino, cyborg, this issue is central to her career and to her health. Last week, Justina became an American citizen. She actually added the name Cyborg to her naturalization papers. And the way ahead for Cyborg in her MMA career has some stark choices, some of which have been, she says, unhealthy. Will Kane now examines the dangers and the lack of options for women pursuing their dream of fighting MMA. Oh, baby. Baby. This is Chris Justino, known as Cyborg. You're all right, you're all right, breathe. Yeah, yeah. Let's put her on the chair, let's put no her on the fun. chair. So, so Just days before fights like this. <laughs> you watch Chris fight, it's violent, very violent. Cyborg pouring it on and she does not discriminate, going to the head, then to the body. These other girls that fight, these are girls that fight. Chris is a woman. Chris. Mixed martial artist. Cyborg is the 145 pound world champion of the all women mixed martial arts organization Invicta. Former UFC champion Tito Ortiz is one of her coaches. She is very dangerous. She's the most dangerous woman fighter in the world. I would like people to respect me like a world champ because I am world champ, but people look like things don't know I am. Here we go! And that, she says, is because she isn't a champion in what's considered the major leagues of MMA, the Ultimate Fighting Championship, or UFC. It is all over! Chris Cyborg! It's not another fighter, though, who denies her that belt. <laughs> it's her weight. Calm up, Chris, you need to breathe. You need to breathe. Yeah. Cyborg, who weighs close to 175 pounds, normally fights at 145. But the UFC has said in the past that there aren't enough strong female contenders that size to have a 145 weight class. Until recently, its biggest class for women was 135. They cannot do this in my body all the time. I don't know, maybe something really bad is going to happen for me. Still, she was last allowed to compete in the UFC at 140 pounds in September, but not for a title. How much did you cut before that fight? The week I was there, cut the weights, 26 pounds. 26 pounds in, in what kind of time frame? Uh, like three, two days. How do you drop 26 pounds in two days? In the beginning, impossible. I was freaking out. You know, you have to dehydrate. I thought this was the part you were looking forward to. I hate this. This is kind of the dirty little secret that's going on in front of our eyes. Let's take a look at the eye now. Dr. Anthony Alessi is a neurosurgeon who for more than 20 years has worked with the Connecticut State Athletic Commission monitoring combat sports. Weight cutting is trying to wring as much water out of your system so you can get onto the scale at a low weight and then replace the water as quickly as possible. Medical experts say any dehydration-based weight cut over 5% is dangerous. This means a fighter's cyborg size should cut no more than 8 pounds of water weight. Chito said when I cry, I lose water. That's good. <laughs> weight issues have long been a problem for cyborg. In 2011, she was caught using anabolic steroids. I did one mistake in my career about doping. You know, I used something for lose my weight. Now she says she does what most fighters do, dehydrates, 
by water loading, drinking gallons of water to send the kidneys into overdrive and flush sodium from the body. Or doing cardio wearing heavy plastic suits in hot rooms. Or sitting in a sauna to sweat off the pounds. We got 700 grams. You kind of have the concept of walking through a desert and not be able to drink water because there's no water around you. You just want an ice cube. You just want a drip of water. Just something to quench your thirst. People don't understand what it is like to cut weight until you cut weight. We're just trying to heat you up. Too hot. No. The bath for me, the worst case. Because burning really hot. Ah, baby, breathe, baby. Baby, it's 105 degrees. Yeah. I go inside the bath, and I pray there, and I cry. What we do is we all sit in our room and watch a human being bring themselves close to death. The consequences can be that severe. We see fighters go into kidney failure as a result of their weight cut. When you drain the body of fluid, you're also decreasing the production of cerebrospinal fluid, leaving the fighter vulnerable to concussion, hemorrhage, tearing of the brain. Extreme dehydration has had tragic consequences. In 2015, Chinese fighter Young Jean Bing died during his weight cut, as did Brazilian fighter Leandro Souza in 2013, and three American collegiate wrestlers in 1997. Where would you place weight cutting on your list of concerns when it comes to MMA? Number one, it's the club shows, it's the medium shows, it's Bellator, it's Invicta, it's UFC, it's everybody. They're all cutting. It's one of the biggest career killers in boxing and mixed martial arts. Andy Foster regulates combat sports as the executive director of the California State Athletic Commission. People are getting as low as they can, and then they balloon back up the next day. They never were that weight, only for like one minute on a scale. So now it's gotten into our culture. Foster says two factors have ingrained weight cutting in MMA. Wrestling culture, where it's common, and fewer weight classes than in other combat sports. An issue compounded for women in the UFC, which until recently had only two women's weight classes, 115 and 135. Page, Ben, Sid, how good was that? There's definitely not enough weight classes for women fighters, especially now that I am bigger. I want to go up to 125, so hopefully they'll open up 125 division or just more women's weight classes so we're not making such significant drops. 114.6 for Paige Benzett. And there are other issues that make cutting weight difficult for women. Many women fighters complain about the fact that it's much more difficult for them to cut weight because of hormonal changes, and that's likely the case. The women have hormones, the women have period, women hold more water, the guys. You gotta poke her face a little bit. Okay, baby, then I should see. I know, but everyone's about to see check this. Everyone's about to see it. Put your shoulders back, head up. Promoters like the UFC, along with regulators, have taken measures in the past year to address extreme weight cutting. Hours have been added to the time between weigh-in and the fight to better allow for rehydration. And fighters are now required to check in at the beginning of fight week within 8% of their target weight. Good luck tomorrow, you too. In November, Cyborg told outside the lines that UFC President Dana White had never offered her a fight at 145 pounds. He said, if you want to keep your job, your next fight will be on 40. So why does UFC want you at 140, a class that doesn't exist anywhere else? I really don't know. I think they don't want to open my division. And then, then if it then try make all the time I'm on 40, 140, 140, maybe one day I can make 135. I can tell you unequivocally, I, you know, we, we're not going to regulate Chris Cyborg at 135. We're just not. We're not doing it. Cyborg says several days after she sat down with OTL for this story, the UFC offered her a fight at 145 pounds, a title fight in February that would open up a new female division. She turned down the offer. Cyborg says her body needs more time to recover from her last weight cut, which landed her in the hospital. The doctor tried to take out my blood, and my blood cannot go out. Too thick, too thick, they cannot go. Because of dehydration? Dehydration. I was dehydrated. This is a young, healthy woman. 
but what has she done for to her body later on when she's out of the fight game? I don't know. Misha looking to choke her out. Wow. She's got it back. The UFC declined to participate in this story, but just days ago announced a 145-pound title fight that won't feature Cyborg. She tweeted, just two months ago, there was no girls at 145 to fight. Now they have a girl who's 0-2 fighting for the belt just to disrespect me. The worst part is I fought for the division. I didn't turn down a title fight. I asked for a March date. Ten years, no division, and no respect. Dana White told ESPN.com, this is a business. I had two girls who wanted to fight for the 145-pound title. This is the pros. If you play for the Patriots, you don't sit around and say, I don't feel like playing this weekend. Cyborg wants to fight again. She wants to fight for a title in the cage, in the UFC. And she says she'll be ready in March. Until then... What does your shirt say? <laughs> Can I see? Yeah, uh, Chrissy Borg against the word. Is that how you feel? <sighs> yeah. I do my best and I have to fight outside the cage all the time. Not just fighting the cage. This is the worst part. Because this is the real fight. Not just for me. I think for everyone. Will Kane reporting. So in the final stages of reporting this piece, the UFC offers Cyborg a fight at the weight she says she can make safely. But those pictures and those accounts of cutting weight in the face of medical wisdom, they're stunning. Let's say hello to a man who knows this sport and this weight challenge rather well. We say good day to Chael Sonnen. Hello. And hello also to former MMA fighter and current commentator Julie Kedzie, who has written that, quote, the final stages of a weight cut are a lot like the worst kind of hangover. Julie, why is that the case? Well, your body is falling apart in, in a lot of ways, but I don't know that your body is falling apart so much that you feel that. When you're hungover, you're in a fog, your head hurts, your back hurts, and your brain just doesn't want to support everything that your body is still trying to do. So um, I do feel like, yes, <laughs> mm -hmm. being in the final stages of a weight cut is a lot like being hungover. It's a, it's a very difficult thing to put your body through. Chael, when you're cutting weight, what sort of advice and oversight are you comfortable with? Yeah, but I'll tell you, it, it, I'm with Julie. It is one of the most miserable and worst experiences that I've ever had as cutting weight. With that said, truly, I loved it. I, I loved the way I felt. I, I loved having the goal and the drive. There's even books written on what it can do to the mind to fast and, and to go without it. Some clarity that you get. Not very many people are going to be able to relate, but Julie will know what I mean. And I also know what she means when she talks about the cramping and the uncomfortableness. Look, it's a necessary evil. You never have to, with the, with the, the top promoters, the Scott Cokers and the Dana Whites, I want to make this clear. They do not force anybody into any weight class. But Bob, once you agree on what that weight class is, it's important that the commission regulates it and that you make the weight. It's a necessary evil to our sport so that we can have equal matchups, so that a big mm -hmm. person isn't fighting a small person. But Julie, we're talking about, at least as reported in, in Will's piece, 26 pounds, she says she's cut in two to three days. By any measure, intellectually, medically, is that healthy? Well, I'm not a medical professional, but I can say that if I were to put my body through that, I would be extremely miserable. However, I have to go back to what Chael said about it is something that you almost love to do as a professional. That kind of suffering, it also prepares you for battle. Now, watching the images of Chris Cyborg in the bathtub when she's sobbing, when she's being carried, when she's shaking, I don't believe that anybody wants to see that. I don't believe anybody wants to see that major of a cut for a professional. And I'm very happy that now the 145 pound weight class has been opened up so that she can compete at you know a level where she's going to be feel, feeling more comfortable in her body. Um, that being said, you know there was something about weight cutting that I did love. It was almost some sort of ritual getting mm. you ready for combat. But taken to that extreme, I, I don't see the point. You know, I, I just don't see the point of putting somebody through that. I do think regulation is incredibly important. Well, Chell, there are those that would say, uh, regardless of whether it's 26 pounds, or whatever you have to cut, that cutting, in, in fact, to the illogical one moment in time when you step on the scale, will still inhibit your performance that you've, you've cut so much. I know the metal, I get the metal focus part, but physically, uh, you will inhibit your performance by doing such a large cut. 
Yeah, you know, you can, Bob. That's true. I'll, I'll tell you, I was an NCAA wrestler, and in, in your lead into this piece, they talked about in 1997 that three wrestlers had passed away. That was right in my era. I was there when that had happened. What the NCAA did to fix that is they made what's called a one-hour weigh-in. What that means is you weigh in, and one hour later, you are on the mat competing. The theory in that, and it proved to, to be accurate in practice as well, was that you cannot dehydrate and then go out and compete. Now, in professional fighting, we do what's called a 24-hour weigh-in, meaning you weigh in, and 24 late, uh, hours later, you're on the scale, which gives you an ability to rehydrate, get that meal, get a second meal, get a good night's sleep. That does change things, but to your point, I have heard many athletes complain that they're a little bit drawn down. Now, that's actually a positive in that it gets people to the right weight class. It's very important that people are professionals. These are consenting adults who we have to take them at their word. When they come to us and say, I can make this weight, I can make it successfully, and I can compete within the confines of the sport. We have to be able to trust them. That's just what adults do. When some people take it to the extremes, it's not great, and it's not great to see what happens mm. uh, with Chris Cyborg. Now, she is just simply, Bob, in my opinion, too big for the weight class. Fortunately, they've made a new weight class, but there's a lot of athletes like her. It's important to find that right number. How political, Chell, though, was it getting to the so-called right weight, weight class? Uh, the implication from some of the reporting here, it, it's very yes, it's a business, but there are politics involved here. Well, I think that's fair, too. And don't forget, you're creating a division. You're not just doing one-off fights where you're grabbing somebody like Cyborg, who's this incredible talent, and then creating something just for her. Well, it's got to be fair for her opponent, too. So ahead of time, generally about three months out, Bob, when fights are scheduled, they will pick a weight, and they'll make it that weight, and you'll sign your name to it. Now, if you can't do that weight or that's too much, you, you've got to adjust that and make sure that's part of the negotiation. The reason Cyborg is such a story is she's such an incredible talent, and they haven't created yet until as of last week the right weight where she can get down to that number and still feel good she's just a big person she's not uh, a lack of discipline i've seen some people say well she doesn't have the discipline to do it that is simply not you're true. saying she's Julie physically she's an me. outlier you're saying that's exactly right she's just got a bigger frame for the 135 pound weight class but she's such a talent we're all cheering for her that they come with that right weight and we can get to see more competitions uh, julie when you were cutting uh, what did you do? How did you do it? What sort of advice? Who was at your elbow? Who'd you listen to about the wisdom of doing it the way you did it? Well, I made a lot of mistakes to begin with, Bob. I tried to cut weight pretty much every way I could find, reading books about wrestlers, going on the internet. Um, at the end of the day, I did work with George Lockhart, uh, Chris Cyborg's coach, quite a bit towards the end of my career, and I found him to be very helpful. But at the end of the day, I had who I consider the best coach in the world, Greg Jackson, beside me, telling me that this is part of the fight, this is part of the art of what I'm doing, cutting weight. If I want to fight at 135 pounds, this is what I need to do, sacrifice there. Um, I did find the best resource for me was those bathtub cuts that you saw Chris Cyborg doing. Again, I never cut to the extreme that she did. I don't think that um, I have the muscle mass, I didn't have mm. the body that, that she did, and I'm, again, very grateful that there's a 145 pound division that we get to highlight this athlete at at the weight that's going to make her very comfortable and she's going to fight well. Hey, Julie, give me a for instance, how many uh, time frame and numbers of pounds? What was the biggest cut you ever had to execute? I would say 15 pounds in three days. Um, I would walk into fight week between 13 and 15 pounds over. A lot of that, I would do a lot of water loading where you would drink gallons and gallons of water and then you would strip down um, and you know try to get all of the water out of your system, get your body to sweat it out. Mm. But I'd say comfortably 13 to 15 pounds yeah. in a week. Chael, does it get more difficult the older, the further advanced in your career? Yeah, I think that, that, uh, that that's fair. There's also uh, new tactics out there. The water loading is a bit of a new one for me. When I was wrestling back in the NCAA, I didn't know about that. To Julie's point with the, the bathtubs and some of the salts and things they can do. Uh, hey, I, I got to tell you, Bob, you didn't ask me, yes, this of Julie, but we all love to tell our, old, our war stories on weight cutting. I did 17 pounds in 22 hours one time. It was a miserable experience. And the only reason I say that... Right, it's, I love that reaction that, that you and the viewer will give. Wow. Most people will go, what are you talking about? That's not possible. But look, we've got it down, man. It's a science when you're in this industry. Don't forget, Bob, I can't think of any other profession on the face of the planet where you weigh somebody in before you let them do their job. If you tried to weigh somebody in if an employee, before they let them go to work, they'd end up in a lawsuit. Yeah. Said with a warrior's pride. A lot of different <laughs> points of view. Chael and Julie, thank you so much for joining us.
Remember that bill that caused the NBA to pull the All-Star game from North Carolina? There is a political drama playing out at this very moment on whether to repeal that bill. That's next, Outside the Lines.